now 43. Welcome to the chapter 12 keynote. So in chapter 12, we were looking at bivariate data. And when we have bivariate data, we have two variables. We have x and y. And when I say x and y, I'm specifically talking about numerical variables. There is, let me write numerical variables. There is the option where they could both be categorical or one could be numerical, one could be categorical. There definitely are those options out in stats. But in chapter 12, when we say bivariate data, we, we mean two numerical variables. All right, so we had two numerical variables and when we plotted those graphs, we called them scatter plots, and we would look for trends in the data. Um, a, a common word we were using was positive trends or negative trends. We didn't use socks, right? So if you'll notice in chapter 12, we weren't talking about shape, outlier, well, we actually did talk about outliers, JK, um, but no center and spread kind of data, right? So we're looking at trends, like the, these are positively related and it's strong or negatively related and moderate. Um, so if we took a look, and this again, my favorite Google images, just Google image scatter plots, and a couple of these popped up. So again, you can see that we have numerical variables in the X and Y direction on both of these. And this has actually got two scatter plots in here. You can see they broke height and weight up um, by gender. And so you can make two scatter plots at the same time. You can even do that on your calculators if you want to. All right, so in terms of making a scatter plot, put your data in your lists. Hey, turn your plot on. So take note that I do have one plot on here and then I have plots two and three off. And you can see I have L1 against L2, and I have the correct type of scatter plot. And you can edit all of that out in this screen here if you want. Hit zoom nine, and there is your scatter plot. And when I say scatter plot, this is just the ordered pairs, right? You see four ordered pairs in the list, and you see four ordered pairs on the scatter plot. That's, that's a different concept than when we actually put the LSRL in, and we're gonna get to that in just a few slides. Okay, so in terms of what is regression, all right? Regression is when we take math functions, functions that you've talked about in some previous math class, and we, we kind of overlay them on our data. So we fit them to our data. And we really focused on linear regression in chapter 12. Um, we touched on quadratic regression, but it goes so much further than that. Um, you can do cubic, you can do any power. So you could do quartic, things to the fifth power. And some of this might seem familiar to you, just depending on how far you've gone in your math classes, and some of it might not seem familiar. If you've done trig, you can actually do sinusoidal regression. Um, exponential regression is really popular because a lot of things, especially out in nature, grow exponentially. Um, we also have lo um, logarithmic regression and logistic regression. And this, I want to touch on this one. This is happening right now, at least as I'm filming this. Um, and this is in May of 2020. So this is how COVID is spreading. And logistic growth, logistic growth, very common um, out in the real world. And what happened was like the coronavirus or COVID-19, it was spreading to a few people initially, and then the spread really, really kicked up, right? We were actually in what we would call the exponential part of the logistic curve, and then it flattened off, right? So we had our spikes, and it's flattening off in terms of the number, technically over here, this would be either the number or the proportion of folks infected, right? And so all diseases behave like this. They start off small, the spread goes real fast, and then it levels off. And it has to level off because eventually COVID, in, in like the worst case scenario, it would spread to everybody and then there's nobody new that could catch it. That's why this graph couldn't keep going up because eventually everybody would have it. And that's how diseases spread and rumors spread that way too. So logistic growth is, is pretty common out in the real world. Exponential is pretty common. We do a lot of linear, things like that. All right, but like I said, for this particular class, we're really focusing on linear. Okay, oops, let me get that. So you choose the best fitting model and then use that model to predict. Okay, so there were four interpretations that you need to know for chapter 12. And the first one we went over was the, the correlation coefficient, R. So that will tell you the strength and direction for a linear relationship, right? Only linear, and it has to be between two numerical variables. So if you want to find it in your calculator, you're going to do stat calc 8, L1, L2, Y1. You need to make sure your diagnostics are on so that R and R squared number pop back up. And if you want to remember or review up how to get to Y1, you hit your VARS key, right? And then function, and then pick a Y variable. All right, in terms of properties of R, there's a bunch of them. So R Again, strength and direction for linear relationships. We don't apply it to quadratics. 
it can only be calculated with two numerical variables. So again, if you had a categorical variable and a numerical variable, variable there is no correlation coefficient between those two. It just doesn't exist. R in and of itself, the way it was constructed, has to be between negative one and one. And graphs with positive slopes have positive R values and graphs with negative slopes have negative R values. And I'm gonna come back to this when we get to our mini tab. So this idea will play itself out in a little example later. Um, R remains unchanged if X and Y are rescaled, meaning that you could add a constant, subtract a constant, multiply by a constant, or divide by a constant. If you did that to, um, consistently to any data value in your list, it would not change the R value. It would change your data values, but R is, um, doesn't get affected by that. It also doesn't get affected by what you call X and Y. Um, and R in and of itself has no dimensions, uh, and it is it gets affected by outliers. It's not resistant to outliers, so it definitely gets affected by those outliers. All right, in terms of interpreting R, let's go ahead and put up the interpretation, right? There's that template, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little example, and I would encourage you to just pause the video, right? You've got height of a plant, age of a plant, and you've got this R. Could you take that information and interpret R? All right, so pause the video, write your sentence down, and then unpause and see if you got this sentence. Would you have told me there was a strong positive linear relationship between the age of a plant and its height? Keeping in mind that you need this back part. If you don't give me the context, if you just cut it off here, I would dock you. So make sure that you're telling me the context in, in all of your problems. Okay, now in terms of how to calculate R, it's, it's gonna be our, our standard stat calc 8, L1, L2, Y1. And you either have the older operating system, all right, or you have the newer operating system. And I did show you a video of how you could convert from new to old. And I would recommend doing that just so that your calculator always matched mine. But just, just know that there's plenty of students through the years I've had that just prefer the new one. So if you prefer the new one, that's great. Just make sure you're using YouTube or Googling how, um, how to do your calculator functions because um, some of them are slightly different than the older operating system. All right, for Y variables, to get to Y1, hit VARS, you're in function mode, pick a Y variable, right? I always say like on Friday, if it's Friday night, you're feeling a little, a little crazy, go for Y5, but I tend to go with Y1 because it's the first one listed. Um, and your diagnostics need to be on. You can see if your diagnostics aren't on, you're gonna be missing the R and R squared. So turn those on, right? It's in the catalog, which is second in the zero key. Turn your diagnostics on, and then your R and R squared will pop up. All right, so in terms of this least squares regression line, and again, I just wanna stress, all it is, it's a line. You could call it a model or a linear model if you want, but we're just taking that scatter plot and putting a line on top of it. All right, so your A is your y-intercept, B is your slope, and that's in, in contrast to what you probably did in your math class. We tend to write them in math as mx plus b, but we tend to write them in stats this way. And there's a reason for that. It has to do with something called multiple regression. But just know that that first number that's isolated, that is your y-intercept. And whatever number is connected to the x variable, that is your slope. All right. So make sure you always put that little hat over there, right? That's the predicting hat. That's what we would predict our y values to be, right? We, we observe y values from our raw data, and then we predict y values from our least squares regression line. Uh, oops, I've got some um, words that I need to put in. Let me erase that. So use the context of the problems and write the words in lieu of y and x. So I wouldn't want to see a y here and an x here. You would actually write the word out for your explanatory variable and the word out for your response variable. And you find it the same way you find R, right? Stat calc 8, L1, L2, Y1. So that calculator command, we've been running it over and over and over again in this chapter, and, and we're gonna keep on running it. All right, now let's, let's practice this. So I want to make sure you can interpret the slope and the y-intercept in context. Like I said, there are four interpretations that you need for this chapter. We already looked at the interpretation for R, and now we're gonna look at the slope and the y-intercept. So I'm gonna put up the template and then that height and age um, example and pause the video, right? take a moment and see, based on this LSRL, could you find the slope and interpret it? And then when you're ready, unpause it and see if your sentence matches mine, right? And so we would have had for every one month increase in the plant's age, the predicted average increase in the plant's height 
is 2.3 centimeters because that number, the one that's connected to the x variable, is your slope. All right, so now let's try the y-intercept. There's my template. All right, pause the video. We know the setup. We've had the setup. All right, see if you can take a moment and then unpause when you have your sentence. And does your sentence for your y-intercept match mine? That when the plant is zero months old, the predicted height is 1.2 centimeters. All right. Okay, now, a lot of times the y-intercept isn't actually meaningful because it's, it's an example of extrapolation. You're predicting outside of your given data range. And th that's okay, it happens all the time. I mean, it's much harder to extrapolate than it is to interpolate. But extrapolation is where the money lives. All right, so with that, in terms of finding the LSRL, same thing as always, right? Stack calc A, L1, L2, Y1. And then you can read your A and B from it. And now if you have your scatter plot and you've actually put something in Y1, now in addition to the scatter plot, and when I say scatter plot, I mean those four data values, right? On top of your scatter plot, you also have something in Y1. You have your linear model. All right, oops, here's the mini tab. Oh, I keep hitting, let me see if I can go back. There we go. All right, so um, I showed you mini tab outputs. I'm not gonna make you buy the program because it's way too expensive, but there are important um, items on here that I'm gonna need us to recognize. And the first one is we need to be able to find the y-intercept. So there is that number, 1.1177. That would be my y-intercept. Right below it is the slope. So this coefficient column is very important in a mini tab output. And then from there, on the newer mini tabs, they actually write the LSRL for you. So you can just see it, and you can see if I color code these, right? There was the y-intercept, yeah? And then 0.218 was the slope. And then there's my x variable, right? I have score one, and you see that I put score one in there, all right? And then they told me it was score two versus score one as I'm going through this. Now, there's my coefficient of determination. That's the fourth thing we're gonna to need to interpret, but here's what I wanna stress. On a mini tab, it does not directly give you r. Right? You see that I was given r squared. So if I have r squared equaling 95.7%, I can find r. All right? So even though mini tab won't directly give you your correlation coefficient, right? I'm gonna put r, I don't know what it is just yet, I can find it. What you need to do is convert this percentage to a decimal, right? And so if I wanna go from R squared to R, I'm gonna square root both sides. And I have to remember that R could either be the positive or negative square root of 0.957. And when I crunch that number on my calculator, I get 0.978. And so you need to decide, was R 0.978 or was R negative 0.978? It's one of the two. And how we determine which root we use, and I, when I say which root, either the positive or negative root, is you gotta look at the slope. So if I look at the slope, because the slope is positive, that means R is gonna be positive as well. So R is gonna be positive 0.978. So here, I'm gonna say R equals 0.978. So even if I give you a mini tab, you could find the R value. You just have to know where to look, right? Square root that R squared number, and then decide, do I want the positive or negative square root? And that's solely based on if the slope, uh, excuse me, if the sign of the slope is positive or negative. And I had mentioned a few side, slides back when we were looking at the properties of R, that the sign of R and the sign of the slope are always in sync with each other. So they're either both positive or they're both negative. All right, the next big thing we learned about was residuals. So residuals, is the actual Y value, minus a predicted y value, right? Or sometimes you'll hear me say observed minus predicted. And we always get our observed from data. Ooh, that is not how you spell data. We get our observed y values from the raw data, and here we get this from, quite literally, our y hat equation, our LSRL. All right, now graphically, residuals are always the vertical drops, and I'm gonna point this out. This is my observed y value, right? So in this case, it was maybe, if I'm looking at it, maybe it was about 1900. And if I look down here on the actual line, that was my predicted y value. And if I'm kind of looking at this, it looks like it's about, I'm just gonna guess it's close to 1600. So that difference there, that means that residual would be about 300. And I'm getting that by doing 1900 minus 1600. So observed minus predicted. All right, so we could do that for any of these, right? Observed y value here, predicted y value here, subtract those two, 
right? Observed y value here, predicted y value here, subtract those two y values. And every predicted y value is gonna be along your LSRL because that's where we get that from. And every observed y value is gonna be the data point, right? The observed, the actual data, because that's where we get those guys. All right, in terms of residual plot, this is a great residual plot. It's a mess. There is no pattern in here. And so we would say, hey, that means your, your model is, is a pretty good fit. Okay. Uh, oh, JK, I thought I was done, but I'm not. Here is a residual plot with a pattern. You can see the parabola in there, right? So this is uh, a bad residual plot. or it's, I won't say it's bad. It's just telling you that, hey, the model you're using is not working, right? Because we have a pattern in here. All right, and so, whoops, sorry about that. Oh, my goodness. Let me get this back up. We have a pattern in here. I was going to make a sad face. Um, so that's just telling us, hey, we should probably go ahead and run quadratic regression, see if that works a little better. Okay, so in terms of the last thing that you're going to have to interpret, it's your R squared, right? So you're going to need to give me your coefficient of determination. So it always explains the, the variation in your response variable. All right, so both of your x's and y's, they're typically varying, right? They're not the same numbers in L1 and L2. And so we look at how much L2 is varying and say, based on how much that is changing, those data values in L2, how much of that can just be attributed to the change in the X, excuse me, the, well, I could say the X values or, or the values in L1, right? How connected are they? And the higher, the better. So again, going back to that height and um, age example for these plants, I could say if R was 0.945, I could square that number and say 89% of the variation in height is explained by age. So imagine that uh, you, you plant some kind of plant and it's growing. Well, it's growth, you can explain almost 90% of why it's growing just based on how old it is. That's all it's saying. Okay, now again, your R squared, right? If I wanted to get to R, I would square root both sides. So we wanna make sure that on a mini tab, you can go both directions from, excuse not even both directions, but you can go from R squared back to R, taking that square root. All right, Oops. is the model a good fit? Oops, I forgot to actually put this in order. So three factors should go into your decision. All right, so it should be, does the scatter plot look linear? All right, is R close to one or negative one? And then is the residual plot scattered? So when I talk about your scatter plot, I'm talking about when you make an L1 versus L2 graph, all right? And we want that to look like a line. And you've seen me in the videos either make a happy face, a medium face, or a sad face, just depending on what I see. And then when I do stat calc 8, I look at my R value, right? And we actually have qualifiers for strong, moderate, or weak. And so again, I can put the happy face the medium face or the sad face, keeping in mind that when you're close to the poles, and when I say poles, I mean one or negative one, because R can always span between negative one and one, and the closer you are to one, the stronger you are, right? So here is the strength, right? So I'll put strong on the, the poles, right? And then you're weakest in the middle. All right, now the big one, the deal, the deal breaker, is always your residual plot. This is the one that's gonna tell you, hey, you're done, or you gotta keep on going. And when you go to make this plot, you're gonna go instead of L1 against L2, you're gonna go L1 against your residuals. And if you do that, you gotta make sure something needs to be in Y1. So let me put something must be in Y1. So if you're not getting a residual plot, Maybe you didn't run stack calc 8, L1, L2, Y1, and that's why you're running into some problems. Now, in terms of being scattered, I have three examples here. So if I look at this first scatter plot right here, all right, if I wanted to go one, two, three in terms of what I know, looking at the scatter plot, it does look linear. Yeah, so I'd put a happy face. I don't know the R value, it didn't give it to me, so I just have to leave it as a question mark. But if I look at that residual plot, that does not have a pattern to it. So that is good, right? So I would actually say, yes, this is a good fitting model, right? Over here, if I tried to do my one, two, three, right? Okay, so if I look at it, I, I actually think it looks kind of linear, right? Again, I still don't know the R value, I didn't get that. But do you see the pattern? I see the parabola in the, in the residual plot. So this is actually saying, no, linear model is not a good fit, all right? 
If we tried to do one, two, three over here, right, this looks like a mess to me. So I'm going to put that or maybe even this, right? It's, it's not looking good. I don't know the R value, but look at the residual plot. It's actually quite messy. So what that's saying is, yes, this line is not that great, but there is nothing better out there. If there was something better, it would have showed up in the residual plot. So believe it or not, I would say, yeah, it's, it's an okay fit, right? Yes, the linear models, it's an okay fit. It's not the greatest, right? But there's nothing better out there. Okay, so the last thing we talked about was outliers and influential points. So outliers, they tend to have large residuals, right? More than two standard deviations above that average. And usually we're finding our residuals in the third list. All right, so I've got, I've got this graph, and you can see that blue dot there. I want us to think about, is that an outlier, right? And you see this, this exponential curve here, and there's a potential outlier. And if we look at it, again, outliers always have large residuals. And these two graphs, they, they would have large residuals here, right? If I made the graph, or excuse me, the LSRL, that would be a large residual, comparatively speaking, right? Because these residuals are, are relatively small. Right, and same deal here. If I made the exponential model, right, my, my little residuals, they're really teeny in here, but this one is pretty large drop. Now, influential points, this tends to change the slope of your LSRL. So if we take a look at that, that pair, that ordered pair there, imagine it wasn't there. If I was just to make this LSRL without that point, it would look something like that. But if I now consider this point, you can imagine the LSRL, it's going to get dragged down, right? This is going to get dragged down and towards that point. And there I am trying to show you the two graphs, the two lines, and that's why this is exercising an influence on that least squares regression line. All right, so last slide. Let's play a little game. Influential, outlier, neither, or both. So we've got some scatter plots, and we've got some, some points that we're going to look at. So I want to look at that that data value or that data point, that one, that one, and that one. And I want us to take a look at this first one here, okay? So there would be my LSRL, all right? I want you to imagine that, that residual, right? Relatively speaking, that is a large residual, right? Because if I was gonna try and make all the residuals for the other parts, right, they're just not as big. Okay, so what do we think? Influence, oh, influential, Observation, outlier, neither or both. And I'm gonna forward through this, right? I'm hoping you said outlier. It's again, very fancy with the sparkles. All right, so let's head over here. All right, this would have been the LSRL if we ignored that circled point. Here's the LSRL if we don't ignore that circle point. And you can see that LSRL over here, it's getting dragged down, it's getting dragged towards that point. All right, so with that all being said, influential, outlier, neither or both. All right. And so let's think, okay, so here we go, large residual still, right? And it's both because it is exercising an influence, right? It changed the slope of the tangent, no, not slope of the tangent line, excuse me. I just drifted into calculus terms. Um, it changed the slope of the LSRL, right? It, it, adjust, it, it um, definitely messed with it. I'm trying to think of the word that goes with adjusted. Oh, well, anyways, it influenced it. How about I say that? And it still has that large residual. Okay, now we're going to head to this one. All right, now that would be the LSRL without that circled point, right? And you can see this is basically like a circle. And anything that's like a circle or a square, I mean, that is actually the lowest um, correlation or the graph of, uh, it's a graph of something with the lowest correlation, meaning the, the correlation coefficient here is, is pretty close to zero. So anytime it's like perfectly symmetric like that, it just means there's really no relationship, linear or otherwise. Okay. So there's, there's the slope, or excuse me, there's the LSRL without the point. Here's the LSRL with the point. So again, think, did the slope, did the LSRL direction change? And do I have a large residual? All right, so influential, outlier, neither, or both. And I am hoping you are saying it's influential, right? Because it, it really influenced how this LSRL would graph out. All right, so here we go. We're going to the last one, right? I want you to imagine there's this, this LSRL. All right, and believe it or not, that's the LSRL without the fancy point. It doesn't actually alter with the circled point. I shouldn't call it fancy, but with that circled point. So you could call this influential, right? Because it is isolated in the X direction. It's all by itself out there. Or you could say neither because it, it actually does fit the pattern, right? 
So yes, we don't have that many ordered pairs that are over here in the X direction. We only have this one, but it actually does fit the pattern. So I would accept either influential or neither. And if you're thinking, well, which one is it? Well, we could get into a whole bunch of stats theory about that, right? So I, I tried to be funny here. I'm gonna assume you're laughing, even though I can't hear you. Um, so the data point is in line with the LSRL um, even before it's included in the data set. So it doesn't actually influence the line. So that's why I would tend towards neither, but I, you could make the, the argument for influential. All right, gang, so that's it for chapter 12. If you got any questions, send me a message over Canvas. All right, thanks so much, take care, and I will see you soon, okay, bye. Hey, Math 43, one thing I wanna tack on to this keynote was I wanted to talk about how, how do we find outliers when we have bivariate data, meaning we have two numerical variables, right? an X and a Y, um, back in chapter two, we, we found outliers if we had univariate data, just that one variable, the one numerical variable, we would find the IQR, we would multiply it by one and a half, subtract it from Q1, add it to Q3 to create the upper and lower bound of our safety zone. And we have something similar in, in bivariate data land in that we create a safety zone, but it's different in how we do it. So let's let's talk about how on earth do we create this safety zone? So the first thing I need to do is calculate S. And if you're wondering what S is, this is your average residual length. All right, and in terms of what a residual is, again, residuals, when I say residuals, we, we talked about it even in this keynote, a residual is your actual Y value. Oops, that's not how you spell actual. <laughs> actual Y value minus your predicted Y value. And really, it's our errors. This is how far off is our prediction from what, what we actually saw, right? And our actual Y values, those always come from our data. And our predicted Y values, they always come from Y hat, right? Our LSRL. So what, what is that difference? What is that residual? And S, in and of itself, is the average residual length. And in a perfect world, S would be zero because what we predicted would be what we actually saw, right? We wouldn't have any errors. But we do have them, so we calculate that S, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna double it. All right, so I'm gonna double that value of S, and basically the positive and negative number that is twice the residual length, that negative 2S to positive 2S, that's your safety zone. And any residuals that are inside that safety zone, they're not gonna be considered outliers, or those are residuals from data points that are not considered outliers. So let me let me, uh, delve into this a bit more. So in order to find S, right, so our first goal right now is how on earth do I find this number? Well, there's a calculator function that will help you with that, and it's linear regression t-test, all right? And it's hard to find. Well, it's not hard to find. You've got to know where to look. So we're going to hit stat. We're going to go over to tests, all right? And then somewhere towards the bottom is something that says linear regression t-test, now, I have a couple of different calculators. In one of my calculators, it's option F. In a different calculator, it's option H. I would not be surprised if for one of you it was option G, all right? Maybe it's, maybe it's all the way down in option I, but it's somewhere down there. So you're gonna wanna try and find that. And then I would imagine that your, your X's are in L1, your Y's are in L2. Go ahead and leave this all as the default. You can see right here, we put in the LSRL, right? Put it into Y1, and then you're gonna go down and hit calculate. And when you do a whole bunch of information, it's gonna spew out. There's so much actually that you're gonna have two screens. And the number that you're really interested in is S. That's the number, that is the average residual length. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna double that. And so let's just say this is about 1.6 or really 1.7. So if I double that in this case, if I double 1.7, I would get 3.4. So my safety zone would be something like negative 3.4 to positive 3.4. And I need to check my residuals against that. And if you're thinking, well, how do I get residuals? Well, again, we go back to it is actual minus predicted, but we have calculator functions for that. So let me remind you how we could find a, a list of residuals. And I know there's a bunch on here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of this for a moment, but let's say your data was in L1 and L2. You could go into L3, and when I say go into L3, again, up in the definition, and define L3 to be the residuals. Let me clear this out just because I know it's getting a little crowded, right? Say, hey, that's gonna be my residual list, and when you hit enter, it will auto-populate. And then you can go ahead and you can check all of these numbers here. And again, I know it's super crowded, 
but I can look against negative 3.4 to positive 3.4. So since it's so jammed up, let me go ahead and I'll switch to purple and let's just take a look Oops, I, at this first one, which says 2.6. All right, 2.6 is inside this zone. So this data point here is not an outlier, right? So not an outlier. And what I would need to do is just go through the rest of these residuals and see if any of them are larger than 3.4 or smaller than negative 3.4. All right, and that's how we do that. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Whoops. Oh, and then right, <laughs> any residual points. Sorry, I probably should have said this too. Let me forward through all of this. I'm doing great. Any residual points outside of the safety zone are considered outliers. All right, now I'm ending. All right, I'll see you later. Bye.